Hello and welcome to Insync Marketing Presents Business Casual. I'm Zach Knightsky and this is a live stream talk show for businesses of all sizes. I've got a haircut since the last time you saw me because now we're allowed to do that. Uh, we've got a phenomenal show for you this week. Um, and I know I say that every week and it's still true. Uh, we've got our guests here, uh, Stephen and Neil. So we're going to get you guys to unmute and re-video yourselves and come on down and come hang out with everybody. Hi there, Zach. Hey there, how you doing? Zach. Hey, hey. Okay. Everybody's jumping on now. Um, we're just waiting for your videos. You want to see your glorious faces and all their splendor. Uh, and I don't mean the artificial sweetener. Okay. I'm starting video, but it doesn't want to. Yep. Same here. You you got control. Uh, okay. Then I will re-video you. Ask to start video. Um, and ask to start video. There you go. <laughs> Okay, jolly good. Um, so we're all there. Excellent, excellent. So before we get started, I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming out and being on the show tonight. We do have a bit of a different show for you. Um, we did have a third person uh, to be on the show, but she unfortunately wasn't able to be with us uh, the last minute. So we're going to be doing something a little different, which I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But before I get to that, I just want to say um, if everybody out there is watching, please feel free to throw some comments out there for the guests. Um, if you have any questions when you're doing a QA, and a um, if you're watching also, please, because you hit the share button, uh, because only you can prevent low view counts. Um, okay, so first part of the show is one of my favorite parts of the show. Um, it's called, Who Are You? And What Are You Doing Here? Um, okay, and so first off, we will start with uh, Stephen. Tell us, who are you and what are you doing here? Well, Zach, um, I'm a dentist. I graduated in 1987. Um, I've been involved in marketing um, of my dental practice uh, since that time. Um, when I graduated from dentistry, marketing was prohibited and I sort of fell into uh, marketing and uh, with a very unusual story that I can share later if you'd like. And as things have progressed, we've gone from print and, and, um, and uh, marketing through uh, our office into digital marketing and social media and all the uh, present uh, marketing that we do now. Fantastic. Um, and rest assured, we will be hearing that story. It is a great story. Um, okay, Neil, tell us, who are you and what are you doing here? Well, thank, first off, Zach, thanks for having me on. I'm Neil Cosby, and I am Director of Business Development at HR Primed, uh, which I uh, am a co-owner in. And at HR Primed, we deliver services that provide uh, companies of all sizes, small, medium, and large, with an HR infrastructure and HR needs. Uh, to help build their businesses. Uh, people are the main commodity of any business and we put in place HR programs, policies, things of that nature that uh, help an organization um, run its people, be able to attract and retain people, um, things of that nature. So everything from recruitment, compensation, compliance with employment legislation, training, uh, benefits, uh, anything and everything, comprehensive suite of services. Amazing. And, you know, it's funny, everyone has such a, I think everyone's got like one version of what HR is. And, you know, when I was chatting <laughs> with you, you were sort of giving me some insights. I was like, oh, that's funny. Like, I would never have considered HR in that respect. So it's, I think it's going to be a very interesting um, perspective coming from you. Because uh, I always feel like the actual person doing HR, it has such a different viewpoint. Um, and so, uh, in lieu of the third guest tonight, I'm going to do something quite unique. I'm going to be talking about instinct marketing, um, because I felt as though, you know, typically I try to keep the, the focus on everybody else, but, you know, with, uh, not being able to have the third person, I thought this would be a good opportunity to share that, share the story with you and share the content with everybody else. So they can get a better insight of what instinct does if you don't already know. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is, um, you know, your origin story. There's always the best kinds of superhero movies. Um, so tell us, uh, let's start with Neil this time. How did you uh, fall into um, what you do now? Uh, in terms of being self-employed as, as an HR consultant, Zach? Is that Correct. What you mean? Yeah. So um, after a few years of uh, working in corporate HR departments, uh, decided uh, that I wasn't really getting any gratification from that and decided to branch out on my own. And I was very fortunate that I basically hit the ground running. It's been um, seven years now. Uh, I had a large network, which um, absolutely helped in being, being able to hit the ground running. 
um, and it's much more gratifying. I uh, find that uh, a lot more, you know, able to contribute a lot more to um, different organizations' success, everything from the private to the public uh, and all types of industries. Okay. You did cut out a little bit there at the end. You say, in the, you say the private sector. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, and public sector. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so Stephen, tell us, uh, how did you get in, how did you end up uh, running your own show? Well, I graduated in 1987, and uh, I always had a plan to have my own practice. Um, I partnered up with a classmate of mine, Dr. Mark Lee Brack, and we had an opportunity in 1989 to purchase an existing dental practice. Um, two dentists who were branching out into another area of business, real estate and develop, were selling a very successful practice. So we decided to go for it and we purchased the practice in 1989 and we founded Dentistry on Dundas. Um, since that time, that practice has grown from myself and my partner. We now have uh, nine associate dentists and uh, 30 staff. And uh, we run a very different type of practice and that is not just general dentistry. We also have uh, very specialties, specialists on staff. We have everything from periodontics, oral surgery, orthodontics, endodontics, anesthesia, and we're all under one uh, rooftop in, in Whitby, Ontario. Okay, fantastic. It's funny, I, uh, I think I've been to Whitby once in my entire life. I typically try to stay very central to GTA, and I was out there once, and I was just like, what, where am I? What world is this? And it's like, it's completely the same, but you just feel like, you know, as I say, when you grow up in Toronto, and you're like, you know, like 10 minutes east on the, on the 401, you're like, oh my God, where, do I need a passport to be here? Yeah, I remember that when I was growing up in Toronto, the only thing in Whitby I knew was Whitby Cartways was a go track, uh, go kart track. And, and I, when I first went out to Whitby, I said, what am I doing here? But like you said, it's 25 minutes across the 401 and it's just part of the GTA. Exactly, exactly. Um, so for my end of it, um, so I'll just tell you guys about Instinct Marketing. Um, it started originally, I used to do marketing consultation for people who had small businesses and, you know, starting their own businesses and they had versions of marketing. It was very, um, you know, uh, rudimentary stuff. And I was trying to help them elevate their marketing because I come from a big agency background where I had, you know, fortune 500 clients and seeing the kind of stuff they were doing. And I thought, you know, these small businesses have the opportunity to do bigger things. We can use those same big ideas, but just scale it down to what they can action and afford. Um, because the two things people, I always say people just assume they can do without any background or training or experience is marketing and graphic design. Um, and I come to them and say, no, no, there's a way to do it. There's, there's a, th there's a reason people go into marketing so they can get experience to do things that people who aren't in marketing can think of to then help you to do it. Um, and so my whole mentality is, you know, maximize impact, minimize costs. So that, you know, the clients that I have come on and they say, wow, I didn't know I could do this whole thing. I didn't know that I could do it to this level or this degree. And it's anything from, you know, paid social ads, um, events and experiential stuff, if that was allowed in the current climate. And sometimes we even just do brainstorms and say, hey, you know, you need an hour of my time just to come up with ideas. Sure, let's come up with some ideas. And if you don't need my help after this, go ahead, run with it, please. More than happy for you to do that. And when COVID hit and I saw people more and more being affected in their business. And I was thinking, how can I help all these businesses out there? And I thought, okay, well then why don't I start this live stream? Because there's other people I know that I was consulting with who were trying to get on live streams and they couldn't because you need to go through approvals and you need, to, you need to get on the right day and you get five minutes. I said, no, no, you can just come on. Do you have a business? Great. Are you nice? Great. Come on down. And you can just talk about your business and here you are. Um, so yeah. So now what I want to talk about is um, what drives you guys? What, what makes you want to do what you do in the way that you do it? Is it just, you know, you happen to be passionate about this particular thing? Um, maybe it's that you want to strive to be innovative at all times. You want to change the industry. Uh, what drives you? Uh, Stephen, let's start with you. Well, being a health professional, I mean, my main focus is, is being able to to help my patients improve their, their life. And uh, we do that in various ways. I mean, the most important thing that you see in a person when they smile, it's one of the first impressions you get is, is a beautiful smile. So that has always motivated my, myself. And, uh, and I've been able to uh, train myself to do a lot of work in cosmetic dentistry and orthodontics. 
Another area which I've branched out into recently, which has been very fulfilling, is in uh, the area of sleep apnea. And I'm helping people change their lives because uh, so many people suffer, suffer from sleep apnea these days. And they don't realize there's ways to treat it um, that relate to dentistry with an dental appliance that helps people get a, a proper night's sleep and to breathe properly. So helping people is okay, my well, focus. Fantastic. I mean, I can tell you that, uh, you know, growing up, you know, would, would ever got my, when, as soon as I got my braces off, my dad would constantly remind me to take care of my teeth because those were now the number one priority. He would constantly remind me of the investment that went into them and said, you better take care of them. So I definitely understand where you're coming from in that regard. Okay, let's hear a big smile. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, you do a good job. <laughs> Actually, I, I have, my, my dentist still appreciate this. I had, a, I had to have a root canal. But it was like it was it went kind of down and it curved up and so he did it he did the whole procedure and he calls his partners hey hey come here let, let me brag let me brag and he like pulls up the thing and he's like showing like look i got like the hook thing in there yeah we get very proud of those uh, small accomplishments hey no, they're not small accomplishments i mean as my, my dad will tell you these are no small accomplishments <laughs> um so neil what what drives you to do what you do in the way that you do it yeah, you know, that's an interesting question and one that I'm often asked, why would you ever want to go into human resources or HR? And actually, it is very fulfilling because the passion I have for ensuring that, um, you know, uh, organizations are getting the best people and getting the best out of their people, um, it, you can, it, it's hard to quantify, it's hard to measure, but all the research indicates you get the right people in the right place at the right time with the right resources, you're going to be much more successful and it creates a better work environment right now. Um, there's a real, uh, what I call war for talent. And actually it's not my term. It's a term that we've been using in HR for years. We have such a labor shortage here in Canada. It's hard to find good qualified people and uh, to be able to assist companies to, to do that and uh, keep them. Um, that's, that's what drives me as well, you know, and especially working in the small to medium sized niche, I get to grow with those companies as they are getting more successful. So. Yeah. It's always fun to kind of watch a company or a client grow. And then you kind of feel like you've been along for the ride and you take you like, you feel proud of them that they're doing so well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's also for me. I mean, what also drives me is that is the satisfaction of watching somebody grow. Um, but it's also, I love big ideas and I love watching ideas come to life. So if I can sit down with somebody and say, Hey, what would you like to do? If you had a magic wand, as my dad always likes to say, if you had a magic wand, what would you do with your business? And they'd say this or that. And I say, okay, then let's do that. And they'll say, no, that's the magic wand. I said, no, no, now we're going to do it. And slowly piece by piece, you figure out how you can make it happen. When you find a version of how it makes it happen, how you can make it happen. And then what started out as an idea in your head, it's now it's real. And you're like, oh, oh my, and they go, oh my God, it's real. And I'm like, yeah, it's real now. Let's do it. Let's go. Let's, then what's the next idea? How do you want it? What's the next step? I'm always looking to push and push and push so that you never, you know, rest on your laurels. Um, okay. So um, talk to me about, uh, actually, Neil, there's a question for you. Something you said specifically to me in the, in the pre-interview, which I was curious about, is um, how you said that your focus is very people driven and you're always trying to make sure that you make you have you know that the happiest employee you make the employees happy is that correct yeah that's part of hr i mean uh just going back to you know how you uh possibly could have viewed hr we're sometimes seen as either the warm and fuzzy people or uh the ones that just show up when you're ready to fire somebody and uh, yeah, I mean, part of an HR role is to ensure that when you do get to that unfortunate decision to let someone go, that all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. But that's not the only thing we do. Um, it's all about, um, you know, if you, the cost of a, uh, a, having a, a underperformer in an organization can be up to two and a half times that person's salary. So it's imperative that when you're looking to get people, you do a solid recruitment plan. And then of course, as I've mentioned, to keep people having those things, uh, you know, those external and internal gratifications like uh, a good pay, good benefits. But more often than not, Zach, if you look at uh, the research, and again, I know this from some exit interviews I've done, people leave organizations because they don't have very good relationships either with their peers or their managers, 
or they just don't like the work environment. The culture isn't to their liking. Um, and, you know, how do you maintain a positive work culture? Well, it's all about making it fun to come to work. It's all about making it the work engaging and challenging. And for some organizations, that's a big challenge to do. Mm -hmm. If you and let I'm, me go on, I'll keep on rambling. So you better cut me off. <laughs> no, no, but it's interesting you say that because I've like, I've worked at a bunch of different agencies and I, you know, the HR people have been nice and fine and whatever, mm -hmm. but I never really felt as though they were there to like, you know, to make us happy. They were there to like, you know, make sure the rules were followed yes. and do recruitment. And like, not that they were, again, they were nice people. They just, it never communicated as that that was their job. I mean, I can tell yeah. you, I had a boss once upon a time and he, he was a, it was an odd duck to say the least. And I remember once we were like, I was not having a good time at work. And he's saying like, you know, you've got, what is it? I don't know what it is with you. Like you seem miserable all the time. Like work's supposed to be fun. I'm like, are you, are you mad? I'm not happy at work. Cause you're the reason it's you. It's literally you. I like everyone else. Obviously I didn't say that cause I liked having a job, but, um, but so is, is that sort of that mentality? Is that sort of unique to your brand or do you find that that's sort of what every HR person should be doing and they just don't? Um, I would say it's the latter. That should be in terms of best practices. It's ensuring you're right. I mean, the happiness, quote, the happiness in a workplace, uh, an engaged workforce comes from the people that are directing, managing and if, the, if at the top it's not good, it's gonna filter down and everybody's gonna, going to feel that and uh, likely not, uh, it won't be a very fun environment to say the least. Sorry, say that last part again, you cut out. Oh, um, if, uh, you know, it, as they say stuff, you know, if you're at the top of the food chain and you're creating a workplace culture that is not fun, that trickles down and you know everybody else feels it right down to the people that are uh, the frontline workers, those that are you know the janitors, whatever. Um, it becomes not fun for everybody else. So uh, I'm not saying that um, you have to provide. I mean, for instance, Google is a, is a very innovative and progressive workplace. They give you a Nerf gun to have Nerf gun fights. That might that might not be for everybody, but it's just one of those things that. Um, companies look at to to make it kind of you know um, a, a good place to work. Yes, there's work to be done, and that has to be done. We have to make money to stay in business, but you can still do it in a way that is um, engaging. When you can get employee commitment to that level, uh, you've done a very good job. Okay, I mean that makes sense. I mean I can tell you that once I had to head out to San Francisco to present at the Facebook headquarters for a client and they like very similar to the Google office. They've got like snacks everywhere and they've got all sorts of fun things, but the attitude is we're giving all these things, but you need to do exceptional work. Mm -hmm. And I think those go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, okay. So Steven, um, talk to us about, I know you had a, you said you've got that really good story about um, how your marketing uh, approach changed for, for the, for pretty much forever. So yeah, tell, tell us all about that story. It's a good one. So um, it started out to, when I graduated, as I said, we, were, we, we weren't allowed to do very much marketing at all. We ran our basic yellow page uh, listing and, and that was it. We had a nice sign and that was about the amount of marketing we did. And, and we, we had a nice little dental practice. Um, then we started a new associate at, at our office and we wanted to um, put her into the yellow pages. Um, this associate graduated from the University of Toronto with a specialty in uh, periodontal disease. So we ran an ad in the yellow pages, or we thought we were going to run an ad that said, uh, Dr. Dana Levy, specialist in gum disease. Well, the yellow pages um, sort of made a mistake. They wrote specialist in bum disease. So at that point, Ouch. <laughs> uh, we, we got in touch with them and we were very upset at first. Then we started to think about this. Let, you know, it, it's a mistake. Let's see what we can do with it. And before we knew it, we were... Um, on various talk shows discussing this mistake. It ended up being a, a chapter in a textbook. And to compensate us for the mistake, the Yellow Pages offered us a full page ad in next year's Yellow Pages. Well, we thought, okay, that's a big deal, a full page ad. Well, that full page ad uh, ended up generating 
more business, business than we ever expected. It's hard to believe that people would pick their de dentist from a yellow page ad, but that's marketing. Sometimes you don't get it and then uh, you fall into this. And from that point on, we decided we're gonna concentrate more on marketing. We developed a marketing budget for our office. We looked at various other uh, means of marketing and uh, we continued that yellow page ad. As yellow pages have gone, this is no longer needed, but we've continued our marketing on a digital manner through, um, through the different uh, various media that, that we're involved with. Yeah, uh, well, now it's honesty time. I'm reminded of a particular Seinfeld episode when Kramer received a proctologist's license plate. And I can't <laughs> help but wonder, were you an inspiration for that episode? Uh, I don't think I was in touch with Jerry Seinfeld, but uh, he might have he might have heard me on the mots. So I was on C CFRB. There you go. Seinfeld owes you millions. Um, okay, so um, next thing I want to talk about is actually on on that note you were talking about the kind of the, the marketing you're currently doing. Talk to us about the 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 current digital well, sorry whatever kind of marketing you're doing these days and how you know you've gone from the yellow page ads to doing what you're doing now. So our progression was uh, from Yellow Page as uh, we, we decided that being active in the community was a great way to, to market ourselves as dentists. So we started various um, initiatives. Uh, we offer scholarships at all the um, different high schools for the students who excel in maths and sciences. Uh, we started sponsoring something in Whitby on a yearly basis. We, we, we sponsor a fireworks display. Uh, although this year with social distancing, there won't be that fireworks display. So the dentistry on Dundas fireworks have been in existence for now 10 years and people were so appreciative of it. And they have, um, they, they realize that, that when we give back to the community that we're there and, and for us, it's our greatest uh, gift is to be able to give back to the community. And, and it just works hand in hand. The more we seem to give, the more our practice has grown. So it's, it's worked out very well. Um, recently, as I said, we, we, we've, gotten very heavy into the digital side of marketing. Um, we've revamped our website probably three or four times since uh, we got a website probably 15 years ago. And uh, we're just in the process right now of, of redoing the website. We have a dedicated team at our office. Um, we have a, a practice development manager who spends a lot of time on digital marketing. Uh, my daughter's now working at the office and she's involved in a lot of the um, uh, Facebook and social media end of marketing. And uh, we, we, we're we always looking for, for new initiatives to, to get our name out there. Shout out to Nicole for always sharing everything as more efficiently than I've ever seen ever. Um, but I do want to say one something you mentioned there about uh, two things that if the fireworks and the website because um, to me, the fireworks is a version of what we call experiential marketing, where you're giving your would-be consumers as well as your current consumers an experience and associating that with the business um, so that they get this great good feeling and then they bring that to like, oh, I want to, I want to go there now or I want to keep going there because, as I say, you've got this great good feeling. And I think that's a, it's a section of marketing I think a lot of people overlook because um, it's newer, that's a newer idea, the whole experiential thing, but a lot of big businesses are doing it. Microsoft does it, Samsung does it. Um, pretty much every brand I've worked on does it in some capacity. And obviously with social distancing, it's harder to do, but eventually the world will go back to normal. And I think it's something we should do. And even I tell my clients, even if you're like a little, little thing, a little, little company, if you're doing, if you're, if you go to Young and Dundas Square and like hand out some candy or something people actually want and it's branded, that's a great way to market yourself. It's not, doesn't cost a lot of money and nothing really ever replaced that person to person interaction. But yeah. at the same time, um, I think, think that a super important thing you said is revamping the website. It's really, really for all those out there listening, it's really important to very, well, not super regularly, but like regularly update the website. Designs change, technologies change, things get outdated and a lot of people kind of get a website and they just leave it forever. And then it shows and people these days really view the business a lot of from the website because that's the first impression they get. Even if you run a digital ad, if you click the ad, the, all the ad does is take them to the website and they judge whether or not they're going to do business with you from how the website looks. So definitely something to keep in mind, make sure your websites look as up to date as possible. Make sure they look as nice as possible, get them properly designed. 
like get somebody who knows design and do it. We say this all the time, get a, like invest in good design. Um, I found it out the hard way because my, my website got stale and I didn't realize it. And our, our rankings started dropping on Google and we started to look at why our rankings were dropping. And once we, it was pointed out to us that having a very modern and technically well-designed website increases your rankings right away. We did that redesign and the company we're working with has just done an amazing job with that. Yeah. And it's interesting because these days, like uh, they always, I mean, on my end from where I've worked, they always say optimize for mobile first um, and then laptops, the computer secondary because people spend more time on their phone than their computers these days. And it's just, um, that's a whole other conversation. We can do a deep dive in that, but it's just, it's something for all the entrepreneurs and business owners out there to keep in mind, keep a website fresh, current and mobile friendly. Um, so Neil, talk to us about the, the marketing you do and how it's changed over the years and how what you're doing now and your yeah. innovative twist on all that. Yeah, it's uh, very much a multi-pronged approach. We are very, we have a deep presence on uh, social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, continually putting up blogs, continually putting up articles of interest that are impacting uh, employers. Um, we also um, have, um, uh, in the whole COVID, um, navigating the whole process thing, we did develop webinars that spoke to uh, uh, employers on different things that were happening with respect to, to COVID. I mean, the employment legislation changes, the health and safety considerations, that's been immense for people in all of this. So we were able to, and these webinars were free. Um, you know, so we, we uh, blasted that out to a number of people, got some good response. And I find that people's hunger for information, employers' hunger for information is, it's never ending. They want to know what they need to, what they need to um, be doing to keep their employee, employees and uh, possibly clients or patients safe. Uh, they want to know what their obligations are um, with respect to, you know, the ESA, which has been amended a couple of times already. Um, we're still under a state of emergency until July 10th. That impacts as well. So it's being timely and keeping people updated. And when clients or possible clients call, having that answer at the tip of your fingertips because you've been on top of that. We start at like, you know, very early in the morning looking at the news feeds, getting the, uh, look, watching for any updates from the Premier, Premier Doug Ford or Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, because ultimately um, in all of this uh, within uh, businesses and organizations, the HR side of things is very heavy. Um, so, you know, we're very much technologically savvy, as I said, but I, I in before COVID, I mean, a lot of face-to-face -face networking. Obviously, I, I don't anticipate going to back to that anytime soon. But what I have found is that virtual networking events, they're a heck of a lot more popular now than in-person events because you don't have to leave your living room to do it. And I know a couple of groups that I belong to that did have in-person events because their turnout virtually is so much bigger. Even when all this is over, they're not going back to in-person events. So I think the virtual marketing, the virtual networking, out of all this, that is the way of the future. So as I said, a multi-pronged approach uh, to marketing and developing our business. Interesting, interesting. I mean, the, the first thing I think to just to touch on what you said for everyone else there is um, everyone else out there in the world, uh, paid social ads, in my opinion, are such a critical first step in marketing, in my opinion. You can target by age, gender, salary, um, what you had for lunch on Thursday, like mm -hmm. pretty much whatever your marital status, like it's, it's crazy how specifically you can target and do they guarantee you sales? Absolutely not. Um, like I said before, that very much then depends on the website, but it is a great way. It's probably the best way to generate traffic to your website. And people think, Oh, it's so expensive. Like you can drop as much as your little as you want mm -hmm. and you'll get solid results. Obviously the more you spend, the more clicks you'll get, but, I think the point is made. Um, the interesting thing you said there about virtual events. So, I mean, for me, I would always, I mean, even if you ask me right now, I would still rather go to an in-person one than a virtual one because I would almost feel more awkward 
at a virtual networking event because it's like, how does this work? Are we in a Zoom call? Does everybody like take turns now? Is this like speed dating? Has, so talk to us about that. Like one, why do you, is, it, is the appeal only that you don't have to leave your house or do you think it's actually just a better setup? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the convenience of it, but you've, you've hit on a good thing there, Zach. They're only as good as um, the person that uh, is the facilitator of them has them organized. So if you have a really good uh, leader in that sense that has a structure to the meetings, has a structure to the events, um, is it going to be a round table where everybody goes around uh, the Brady Bunch squares and talks about uh, their business? Uh, or you know, can you have private chats with people? So it's important to lay that groundwork first for any kind of virtual networking. And don't get me wrong, I'm still missing the face-to-face -face and uh, going out for you know snacks and a quick drink and uh, and getting into some engaging talk. But if this has to be the way of, uh, that it is for the next little while, I'm comfortable with it as well. So, and just talking about uh, just to dovetail on what Stephen was saying, website. Yes, we updated our website this year. Uh, it looks a heck of a lot better, much more user friendly, uh, easier interface, easier to navigate. And uh, I can't agree more with your points on make sure your website is fresh and up to date. Excellent. Um, so now we're about halfway through. Uh, so I just want to reintroduce our guests today. We have uh, Dr. Stephen Millman from Dentistry on Dundas. We have Neil Cosby from uh, HR Primed. Um, so for all of you out there, if you have any questions for them, please do throw those into the chat. Uh, we will have a Q and A in just a little bit. Um, and yeah, so the next question I want to ask is uh, the big one, sort of the, the big old elephant in the room these days, uh, the COVID situation. Uh, so talk to us about how your business been affected by COVID. And let's start with, uh, start with Stephen this time. Well, uh, my business has been dramatically affected by COVID, of course. Um, we recently um, got back to routine care. Um, when COVID first, uh, when they first did the shutdown in, uh, in uh, the middle of March, 99% um, of the dentists shut their doors. Um, at Dennis Van Dendas, we were fortunate. We were able to procure the proper PPE needed. So myself and my partner, Mark Liebrach, were, were in the office on a daily basis. Uh, treating emergencies and keeping people healthy and keeping them out of the hospital. Uh, now that we're back to routine care, um, the protocol is uh, very different and it depends on um, social media and it depends on mobile telephones and, and, and communication. We only let in um, one patient into the office at a time for each doctor. They are screened at the front door before they come in. They, they have their temperature taken. Every patient has to enter with a mask on. Um, they continue to wear their mask until they're in the dental chair. Um, sanitization, of course, they're, they're sanitizing their hands. They're sanitizing their mouth before I see them with a, with a, a pre-rinse. And um, once they're in the chair and we're working, um, our rooms look dramatically different than they used to be. They're now closed off for the time being, although that should change shortly. And uh, we're doing our best to keep everyone healthy and safe. And, and so far, uh, dentistry, as always, has been extremely safe. There has never been a uh, connection from COVID-19, a transmission from patient to, to doctor or doctor to patient. And that's throughout the world. So we're, we're very proud of that. Yeah, because I think you were telling me that like, if you needed to be in a super sterile place, a dentist's office is pretty much the place you want to be. Uh, one thing I was curious about, um, I know that in certain, are you saying you're just getting back to routine care, but where do they draw the line between, you know, uh, emergency or essential, I guess you'll call it essential versus non-essential? Like what could somebody get done versus not get done? Right. So when we first came out, our, our college that sets our rules gave us a very strict um, guideline. Um, emergency dental care meant that the person had to be suffering from pain or swelling or bleeding, and that couldn't be treated with over-the-counter medication. So that was emergency care. Then we went to urgent care, which included things like broken teeth or, or things that if you left for too long a period would result in pain and swelling. Mm -hmm. And then from urgent care, we went to routine care, which we're all familiar with coming in for your checkup and cleaning, uh, keeping preventative maintenance of your mouth and uh, doing orthodontics, cosmetic dentistry, all, all the various fields that, that we deal with. So right now we're seeing patients as we were pre-COVID 
in terms of the care we're providing. It's just the way we're providing the care. It's a little, I call it slow dentistry. It means we have to spend more time on the um, getting the patient into the chair and getting the patient out of the chair and the room sanitized and sterilized. Although we, we always did that from right from day one. Makes sense, makes sense. By the way, Corey, if you're still watching, I can see my friend Corey Werman, who's also a dentist, just jumped on. Uh, Corey, shout out, share the video. Uh, okay, Neil, tell us how your business has been affected by COVID. Well, it's uh, actually been pretty steady throughout. Uh, as I indicated earlier, I mean, this has been a time where people have needed uh, human resources more than ever. Um, so, you know, early on in this, mid-March till the big, middle of April, I didn't need to set an alarm because my phone was going off at 6.30 every morning uh, with clients and prospective clients needing guidance as they wound, navigated their way through these uh, ever evolving, sometimes by the hour changes. So, and we were kind of fortunate in that we had uh, created pandemic planning, emergency preparedness and um, business continuity resources and um, blew the dust off them. And uh, that was very helpful for a lot of our, our clients. So it was a bit of a uh, pivot and be agile to respond to the, the, the new needs of clients with respect to what am I? What are my rights as an employer? What are my employees' rights? Um, how do I navigate temporary layoffs? Things of that nature, and we, you know, facilitated assisting them through all that. And then, when now that we're in partial recovery, it's facilitating. What does that look like, health and safety-wise, in the workplace? And Stephen was a great example of, you know, how an organization has to set themselves up. Uh, it. And it doesn't matter if it's dentistry or a factory or a construction, there are still protocols that have to be followed. Um, and, um, you know, uh, again, there's also been a fear of some employees of, I don't want to go back to work, I'm afraid of catching it. Um, so it, uh, assisting cl uh, clients with that, uh, trying to put things in place so that employ employees feel safe coming back to work. It's been a pretty... Um, you know, significant impact on people. Not only have people had to worry about, am I going back to work? Am I going to have money for rent next month? Uh, but it's also worrying about uh, your family members. I mean, I've got uh, two parents that are in their 70s and that weighed on as I was still working at home doing my work, it still weighed on my head, weighed on my brain about, I hope they're staying safe. So um, it's providing that, it's also making sure that employers are checking in with the mental health and wellness of their employees because if you have a distracted employee uh, they're not a productive employee either so it's been as i said a pivot remain agile and uh, supporting both employers and employees through this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one thing i just want to clarify something you said in the beginning so just to make sure there's a 6 30 in the morning now <laughs> <laughs> yes, before COVID, it was actually a little bit later. Now it's uh, a little bit earlier. <laughs> I've probably been working harder during this than I have pre-COVID. <laughs> it, it, it's such a dichotomy. Some people, they say like, oh, if my business was just like, poof. And the other ones are like, I'm working harder than ever before. Um, but another thing you were saying before is just also like the mental health of people. I think it is really important to keep in mind. And obviously, you know, it's, it's always been an important thing, but particularly with the world as it is. And yes, we are relaxed on certain things. And fortunately, the golf course has been opened up so we can go to the driving range if we need to. And man, that's definitely helped me out. But um, it's 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 going to be hard. And, you know, how do we go back to this? I mean, we can say like what yesterday there were, with the, if you take out Windsor, there were 80 cases in Ontario. Exactly. So you could argue logically, sure, like what do you need to worry about? But then it's it's the emotional component that, that also is going to take over and mm -hmm. in going back to what mental health, it's it's emotion versus logic. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think you have to be really cognizant of the, the staff that you have. Um, I have some staff who have anxiety disorders to begin with. And then to bring them into this COVID situation was very challenging. Um, the, the main thing was getting them back in the door and showing them that we had a safe environment for, for both our staff and our patients. And once they got comfortable back in the front doors and in their positions, it helped them deal with this and help them get over the mental anguish that they've all been going through. And you've got so much information floating out there. You've got 
you know, those that are taking this very seriously, which I think you need to do. And then you've got the naysayers saying, what, you know, so 80 people got sick, big deal. Um, only 80 people got sick because the majority of us are doing what we're supposed to be doing. Um, we're not uh, anywhere near the United States numbers because we, I, I truly believe people have been paying attention to these protocols and taking it seriously, so. Yeah, I definitely agree, definitely agree. Um, so now we're gonna do is we're gonna shift gears for a second here um, and we are going to take some questions from the chat. Uh, first question is for Dr. Millman. Uh, he wants, uh, David Druss wants to know, is it difficult to manage multiple types of dentistry in one business? Um, not really because uh, with the way we collaborate with each other, it's actually qu quite easy. Um, in a lot of offices, when you refer a patient outside of the office, there has to be um, phone calls and letters and uh, x-rays exchanged to co coordinate a treatment plan. Whereas when we have all the specialists working in, in one office, it's a matter of walking over and saying, hey, take a look at this. What do you think? And how are we going to treat this? So in many respects, I found it a lot easier working in that environment and collaborating with, with my associates and, and specialists on staff. Interesting. And what would you say, I know you talk about like a lot of the very, what's the really, um, the innovations you like to bring into the office. What are some of the more innovative things that you do? For sure. Yeah. That's another thing I'm very proud of at Dennis and that's is our technology. Um, we, We've always been on the forefront of technology. We were one of the first offices in Ontario to um, do something called digital scanning uh, with a, a machine called an iTero. So rather than taking um, an impression as you went through for your orthodontics, where they put that messy gooey stuff in your mouth, we use an optical, optical scanner to generate a digital model. And from that digital model, we can um, design the braces or design the Invisalign. We can design crowns. Um, we do all um, night guards, sleep appliances. So, uh, and the accuracy of these digital scanners is just incredible. Uh, we also use something called comb beam technology. It's a three-dimensional x-ray as opposed to the traditional two-dimensional x-rays that um, you're used to in the dental office. So a 3D machine um, rotates around your, your skull and we get a 3D image. And again, for treatment planning and for um, diagnosis, it's just, heads and tails. It's comparing color TV to black and white TV. It's, it's having, looking at something in three dimensions gives us way more information than a traditional two dimensional x-ray. Uh, yeah, it's, it's funny because there's certain things about going to the dentist, you just like accept that's just how it is. And then you bring in like 3D, 3D x-rays. I'm like, what do you mean? That, that's an option? Although you reminded me of a Robin Williams thing where like from the patient's perspective in his stand up, we're talking about, you know, yeah, they talk about the dentist at the dentist, like, oh, yeah, it's just a little x-ray. And then they give you, they give you like the tiniest bib known to man. They run out the room and you hear them and speaker. it's going to be fine. Right. Just sit tight. <laughs> um, okay, so Neil, question for you. Um, has COVID made your job harder with so many people being let go? Um, it's definitely, uh, it, it, in terms of that, if I'm the one having to deliver the message that, you know, unfortunately for the time being, you don't have a job. Yeah, that's been difficult. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, being able to, if, I, as far as I'm concerned, the federal government stepped up, there was the CERB, which although not, you know, it, 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 it probably doesn't replace people's full income. It has been helpful. Um, but uh, it, it's also providing people with a little bit of hope that, you know, um, we're going to get through this. And now we're starting to see, see people get back to work. And uh, it's uh, a lot more uh, invigorating to be telling people, yeah, you're getting recalled back to work. Um, so uh, it, from that aspect, that's been what it's been for me. Okay, great. Um, all right, the next question is, do you think, sorry, sorry, let me phrase it differently. What, um, what changes do you think we've experienced in the workplace due to COVID? Which ones do you think are going to stay versus which ones do you think we're going to eventually going to grow out of once everything sort of gets back on track? Uh, yeah, great question, Zach. And, um, you know, we're already starting to see it. Uh, the remote workforce, um, some employers are saying, you know what, just, you know, this is more efficient, more less costly for us, continue working at home. Um, so there's going to be that. 
that has its pros and cons. Uh, as I drive into Toronto these days, it's a heck of a lot less traffic. Um, and I'm able to get there in a timely fashion as opposed to four hours. Um, but again, not everybody is uh, equipped or wants to work at home either. Uh, some people need that structure of going into work on a daily basis. So you have to be mindful of, is it a fit for the personality of your employer or uh, employee, I should say. Um, I do believe that the health and safety um, components of this, um, so plexiglass, I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. I think that's going to be in place maybe forever. Um, so certainly some of that. Um, and I think uh, organizations now are getting the message, we have to be prepared for this. Um, I think we went through so many, what, I, what I've been calling dry runs with SARS, with the, the great blackout of 2003, with the H1N1 scare, with the Ebola scare, and, and countless other things in between. And none of those, of course, had the impact that COVID has had. So organizations, I think, are going to take stock and come up with plans that if we get hit with such an extreme event like this, how do we still maintain business? Mm -hmm. And um, I keep saying it's fortunate that this hit in an age where we have video conferencing, all the technology that we have. Can you imagine if this had hit 20, 30 years ago? No Skype, no Zoom, um, no Facebook. Uh, email, uh, remote working from home, it would have been a hell of a lot worse to be perfectly blunt. Yeah. So um, I think we need to count our blessings there. But yeah, I think organizations are going to take stock of how much better prepared can we be so that if this happens again, we can maintain as normal operations as possible. Mm -hmm. I think the really important thing to be mindful of is the individual uh, person we're in the work from home situation. Because I can tell you, I um i would love working from home i've always said even like before covid like at every job i've ever had like you know let me work from home i'm at optimum efficiency i'm working from home i'm comfortable i can get up and get a snack i have food like i can just do what i like and i can get it done the way i want to get it done but some people like especially from what i heard like people with kids like little oh, yeah. kids like yeah. they love going to the office it's like a break oh thank god but now when they're at home and every day they've got a parent and work mm -hmm. so it's sounds very it's just a very different situation yeah. uh for dr dr millman how do you deal with already nervous dental patients with the COVID situation um you know as as you have we, we've discussed we've done so many measures to prepare our patients in advance of, of what's going to happen when they get to the office so um it's really no different than what i was doing a few months ago and and the personal touch that we can provide between myself and my tremendous staff. Um, they know they're coming into an environment where they're going to be well looked after. Um, we offer as many things to make people as comfortable as possible. Um, for instance, uh, laughing gas, nitrous oxide for those people who can't overcome anxiety. Um, we give them some nitrous, nitrous oxide. They feel a lot better and they can get the work done. Uh, we, off, we also offer general anesthesia. For some, some people can't bear to have anything done and they have to be actually put to sleep for their dental care. And that's something we offer as well. But I, I'd say the vast majority of our patients, 90% are very comfortable coming into our office. They trust us and that's a relationship we've developed over the years with our patients. And, and once you have a patient's trust, uh, you feel comfortable and the anxiety is much easier to to deal with. I just want to go back to, to one thing that, that Neil said, that things have changed forever. Um, they haven't, they haven't. I mean, we have to remember that we've dealt with viruses all our lives as a health professional. I remember I graduated when, when AIDS came to light and, and things changed drastically then and, we, and for the better. Um, we're always going to have viruses. We're going to develop uh, treatments for, for this virus. We're going to develop vaccines. I don't think all these barriers are going to be necessary in the future. I think barriers do um, perpetuate fear. And I would like to see a lot of these barriers come down. Um, I think in, in many ways uh, we've reacted and, and we've, we've dealt well with this, but uh, um, we're always going to have viruses. And this is just another virus with some very adverse outcomes, unfortunately, but 
we've, we've always dealt with this and we're going to deal with it again in the future. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting you say that because I mean, I remember when the first wave got hit and you know, people were nervous about going to get tested in the first place and they were, and they were umming and on, but then there was some doctor who would say, don't go get tested because if you're not sick and you haven't been near somebody who is sick, you might get it from somebody who's there. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to get like a perspective from like the actual medical side of it. Um, okay, so I think my last question for you, thank you. Uh, my last question for you guys is what advice would you give to people who either want to start their own business or people who have their own business but are looking to kind of just get it going? What, what advice would you give to them? Uh, Neil, let's start with you this time. Um, so I would say, you know, plan it out. Uh, take stock of, you know, um, what can I, why do I want to do this? What is my reasoning for it? I, and I would say, you know, if your prime reason is you want to make more money, you might want to reconsider it. Yes, everybody needs to make a living. But I know from uh, a lot of, you know, fellow consultants, fellow self-employed people, it was more than just making money. But have a plan. Uh, make sure you have a big network. And um, don't, when you finally take that leap to be self-employed, don't be scared. Just run with it. Um, don't worry about the money. If you worry about the money, that will hold you back. Uh, and then I think I said to you in the pre-interview, Zach, I don't have a lot of regrets in life, but my biggest regret is waiting until I was in my 40s to decide to go self-employed. I wish I'd have done it much sooner. So It's funny. My dad's other famous line is, we never regret the things that do. We regret the things we don't do. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, okay. And Stephen, what, uh, what advice would you have for the entrepreneurs out there in the world? Well, obviously, uh, I always, as I've told my children and, and, and my family, be passionate about what you're doing. Work hard. Hard work always pays off. Um, when you find your niche, find a way to differentiate yourself within that niche um, because you have to be creative and you have to find ways to, to stand out amongst all your other good colleagues out there. And um, be honest and trustworthy. Okay, fantastic. Makes sense to me. Very dadly advice. Um, okay, so that's just about the show. I just want to say thank you to everybody out there in the chat who, uh, or, and all the viewers out there who've been watching. If you could please share the video out, it would be fantastic. We'd love you forever. Um, so I want to say thank you to our guests for coming down. I'm going to give you guys one last chance to uh, tell people and plug the business and tell them how we can find you. Uh, Stephen, let's start with you. Sure. Um, my, off, my website is www.dentistryondundas.com. Um, we have a great website. You can go on there and we're in beautiful downtown Whitby in a standalone building, um, 25 minutes across the 401 and, and you can get to my office. Fantastic. And, uh, what do you have any social media pages we can follow? Um, I should be aware of, yes, we do. I'm, I know we have a Facebook page. I know we're on Instagram. Um, but uh, my we'll daughter search dentistry on Dundas and on Facebook and Instagram. That's correct. P perfect. Thank and uh, Neil, so tell me how, how, do, how do we find you? How do we connect with you? Well, we have a website, www.hrprime.ca. Uh, you can actually contact us through the website. Um, if you want to reach out to me personally, it's neil at hrprime.ca. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, we have a presence on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Uh, so please, by all means, follow us, uh, connect with us that way. Um, and, uh, you know, what, uh, either myself or another consultant will reach out to you to uh, find out what all about your business and what your needs are. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming on down. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I'm Zach Knightsky. This is Instinct Marketing Presents Business Casual. And we will see you again next Tuesday. Thanks, guys, and have a grand old time. Talk thank to you later. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.